Good afternoon. Uh, we're about to start with, uh, today's seminar, and uh, I'd like to uh, point out, please be aware of the exit signs around you in case we need, the, um, need to leave the room on short notice. Um, and also, um, we uh, strongly um, suggest folks that are on the internet uh, to send in your questions for the Q&A at uh, your earliest opportunity so we could have sufficient time to air it before the end of the seminar. So with that, Nargis. Thank you, Peter. Welcome everybody to today's uh, technical seminar titled Risk of Pediatric Asthma Morbidity from Multipollutant Exposures which will be presented by Dr. Ralph Delfino and Dr. Michael Kleeman. I'm Nargis Jareen, the contract manager of this study, and this study is part of the research division's ongoing investigation of the adverse impacts of air pollution in vulnerable populations in California. I would like to introduce Dr. Ralph Delfino, who is the PI of this study. Dr. Delfino is a professor and vice chair for research and graduate studies, Department of Epidemiology, UC Irvine, and is associate director of the Genetic Epidemiology Research Institute, UC Irvine. His studies have been designed to evaluate the relationships between health outcomes and air pollution exposures in susceptible populations. I would also like to introduce our other speaker, Dr. Michael Kleeman, who is one of the co-investigators of this study. Dr. Kleeman has been a faculty member in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Davis since 1999. Professor Kleeman's research is focused on the study of urban and regional air quality problems with an emphasis on the size and composition of atmospheric particles and gas to particle conversion processes. Dr. Delfino will begin the presentation, which will be followed by Dr. Kleeman. Please help me welcome Dr. Delfino and Dr. Kleeman. Dr. Delfino. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Nargis, for that introduction. And uh, let me begin by first pointing out that uh, what I'm saying here uh, about asthma morbidity refers to, morbidity is referring to asthma hospital admissions and emergency department visits. So throughout the talk, uh, when, when I say asthma morbidity in relation to this study, that's what I'm talking about. And often I will combine the two admissions and ED visits uh, in called in hospital encounter. So this is an outline of the uh, presentation. I'll start with a little background and overview of the study, and then uh, Professor Kleeman will then step in and talk about his work on uh, task one of the project, uh, which is develop, uh, to develop exposures uh, that we'll use for the epidemiologic tasks, which are tasks two through four, and then we'll uh, end with some overall uh, points. So first, what is asthma? Uh, well, the key, the key uh, phenotype, if you will, of asthma is chronic inflammation in, in the airways. Um, and this is associated uh, over time with uh, hyper-responsiveness and the combination of those things uh, leads to asthma symptoms. Symptoms like wheezing, uh, shortness of breath, uh, coughing, uh, chest tightness, and, and, and so forth. And as these worsen, of course, uh, acutely, uh, they can lead to a hospital admission or uh, an emergency room visit. The, uh, the key part of asthma that I want to emphasize here is that, um, uh, is that it's a very variable disease. So you can be normal one day, breathing fine, uh, and then have airflow limitation the next day that worsens and worsens, and after uh, several days you end up uh, in an emergency room. Um, so, so it's a very, uh, very clearly a, an acute on chronic disease. So I'm going to first talk about some epidemiologic research of acute asthma and air pollution that's relevant to this project. Um, overall, uh, looking at both experimental and epidemiologic data, acute asthma outcomes, that's as opposed to chronic asthma outcomes that have been linked to air pollution include all the things I just told you about, um, you know, the bronchial hyperresponsiveness, decreased lung function, increased symptoms, uh, inflammation in the lungs, uh, and so forth. 
but it also in, includes uh, what the topic today is, which is increased asthma mor morbidity from hospital admissions and uh, ED visits. So most of the studies that have looked at that have been uh, time series studies. And the time series studies have been heavily reliant on ambient air pollution data uh, because it's available and oftentimes uh, you're using account data. Uh, so basically the number of hospital emissions per day in relation to the ambient air pollution levels. Uh, so I'm sure you're all familiar with the time series studies. Um, so what we're doing today is, is related to that, but as I will talk about the design, it's, it's quite different. Uh, one of the kinds of study designs that I've used uh, uh, almost exclusively for many, many decades has been the cohort panel study. And a panel study, you can follow individuals over time. So these are, these are really great studies to, to understand acute asthma in an individual asthmatic. And uh, what we've seen and others have seen is that exposure markers of traffic-related air pollution, and I'll abbreviate that TRAP, like NOx and elemental carbon, have been associated with, again, all of these uh, acute asthma outcomes, including symptoms and air, uh, airway, uh, uh, um, uh, air, airway inflammation, uh, as well as um, decreased lung function. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that are uh, quite commonly seen is that when we look at ambient particle mass, like PM2.5, in relation to individual outcomes, sometimes we don't see an association, uh, whereas we do, uh, with traffic-related air pollutants, or the PM associations are confounded by the traffic-related air pollutants. And then finally, uh, what we often see is that personal exposures are associated with asthma outcomes in panel studies, but not ambient exposures. Okay, and uh, that's, uh, that's kind of to be expected uh, in a smaller population as opposed to a large time series population because you're dealing with exposure error. So uh, I just wanted to point out three, uh, what I think are very important uh, time series studies and their findings. Uh, the three studies were conducted in uh, um, New York City, Atlanta, and Canada, very large studies. Uh, and the general conclusion from these studies is that asthma morbidity is associated with ozone, PM2.5, and primary combustion gases and aerosols um, being indicators in oftentimes, particularly in, in our region, of traffic-related air pollutants. And the associations are commonly seen in the warm season. Now, these are uh, generally colder areas of the country than, than our study uh, area. And so you don't, you don't see quite as much in the cold season. Um, the other very important thing is that associations between asthma morbidity and ozone tend to be independent of PM2.5, okay? Uh, and again, uh, particularly in, in the summer season. And also independent, ozone is independent of uh, TRAP. So these are important considerations when thinking about the uh, effect of multiple different pollutants on, on asthma outcomes. So this is a New York study um, by Silverman and Ito, a wonderful study uh, that looked at um, asthma admissions, hospital admissions, and uh, they focused on the warm season, um, primarily because everyone only sees associations with ozone in the warm season, not the cold season, for obvious reasons. And so they co-regressed PM2.5 with ozone and observed, it's not shown here, but they they observed uh, basically uh, little change in, in the estimate of association for PM2.5 and ozone when the two are put in the same equation. So that's what's shown here. So PM2.5 in this graph is adjusted for ozone. Ozone adjusted for, is adjusted for PM2.5, uh, x-axis being the relative risk by interquartile range. And this is different age groups, so from, from very young to, to, to elderly. And I think you can appreciate here that uh, all the point estimates, just about all of them are, are positive and, and most of them are significant. And so, so uh, clearly there's something going on here that PM2.5 is representing an, a completely different exposure. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of obvious, but it's, it's nice, uh, particularly when you see in, in these regions like New York, there is a positive correlation between the two. Nevertheless, you still see these independent associations. So some of the key questions that are emerging from the time series analysis of asthma uh, and air pollution are what contributes to the independent effects of ozone and PM2.5? 
okay? Is it, is it the secondary or primary organic aerosol fractions of PM2.5 that are not well correlated with ozone? Because recall what I said, the two actually, particularly in these areas, are, are relatively correlated in, in, in the summertime. Um, the other thing that, that emerges out of these studies, because they're focused on ambient air pollution, is what is the, what is the effect of TRAP given its high spatial variability? In other words, you know, is there, is there an effect of local variation in air pollution that's not captured by the ambient air pollution uh, signal? So the other thing I want to talk about that's a focus of this, uh, this study uh, that we did is socioeconomic status. The poor. And that's partially because of lack of access to health care. Um, and other correlated risk factors, some of the correlated risk factors that may be enhanced in, in poorer neighborhoods uh, that could increase psychosocial stress, uh, indoor allergens, indoor air pollutants, passive smoke, and other things that, that could uh, be correlated with, uh, with poverty. Um, the other thing that we know, uh, including in California, is that children who live in low-income communities tend to live near high traffic. Uh, Wealthier families uh, have the funds to, to get away from polluted areas, and that's where they live. Um, so, so the thought is that certainly socioeconomic status could be a potential confounder for the relation between air pollution and asthma. However, quite a few studies have shown that uh, SES is an effect modifier of the relationship between air pollution and asthma. And I give a few examples here, cited uh, here at the bottom. So next, I'm going to talk about data gaps uh, in the literature and, and with a particular reference to, um, to exposure assessment. So highlighted in red here, let me see if I can get this pointer to, there it is. So highlighted in red are the things that we are focusing on in, in our study. So the first, uh, the first issue is that there's limited knowledge about the effects on asthma by different particle size fractions. Okay, there's also limited knowledge about sources and composition. Uh, we're just going to focus on sources because we don't have component data. Um, there's also a lack of data, as I said, on differences in association between, associations between local exposure and ambient exposure. And then finally, very little is known about the relationship between asthma and two key uh, particle uh, characteristics, which are primary organic aerosols and secondary organic aerosols. So primary organic aerosols being from combustion sources. Um, this is especially traffic-related combustion sources in the study region of LA, of the LA basin. And then secondary organic aerosols being um, photochemically produced from, from combustion-related or other uh, sources of, of uh, volatile, volatile or semi-volatile uh, precursors. Um, so Limitations of ambient exposure data that are commonly used, uh, particularly in the time series studies. Um, although there have been associations with them, uh, the question is, is to what extent has exposure error uh, uh, affected these results? And what are the effects of unmeasured pollutants um, that, uh, that people are experiencing in their na own neighborhoods, particularly toxic uh, air pollutants? So this is an example that you've probably seen uh, before. Showing, um, showing a marked spike in the concentration of traffic-related air pollutants like elemental carbon and carbon monoxide, as well as ultrafine particle number concentrations just downwind of a freeway. So on the left, you see background concentrations, and as you get closer to the freeway, it spikes. And this is a relative, this graph is relative. Um, so we go from you know, 0 to 100, uh, or 0 to 1. So you spike that then decreases as you go further away from a freeway, as you go you know, down, downwind about 300 meters. Um, you see a similar spike in, in uh, fine particle mass, um, but just not, you know, not nearly uh, the, the relative change that you see in uh, traffic-related pollutants and, and ultrafine particles. Um, the, other, the other thing that, um, that's often not taken into consideration when, when thinking about Spatial variability, certainly temporal variability is, is, is important here, or air stagnation events, so air inversions uh, with cold stagnant air uh, with a trapped layer of pollutants uh, beneath. 
and uh, we're very interested in this because we think that uh, not only does it increase air pollution regionally, but that there are going to be significant variations by location depending on point sources, line sources like traffic. Um, so that if you have an air stagnation event and you're near a, near a source of air pollution, it's going to be worse than at other locations, even though pollution might increase you know, everywhere. So in this study, we took advantage of, of that, and I'll tell you about that in just a bit. So this is an overview of the study. Task one that will be presented by uh, Professor Kleeman is to estimate exposures uh, to primary and secondary aerosols um, using the uh, UC Davis Cal IT source-oriented chemical transport model. So he'll be estimating uh, primary and secondary organic aerosols, size resolved mass, and then POA source apportionment. And then uh, the epidemiologic task that I'll be discussing is to look at the relationships between asthma morbidity and both the air pollution exposures that uh, Dr. Kleeman uh, estimated, as well as um, uh, some exposures that we estimated using dispersion model and ambient air pollution from uh, the um, EPA monitoring sites or AQMD's monitoring sites. Then the next two tasks are really to look at effect modification uh, by what we think are important factors. Uh, the first would be recurrence of asthma, so that uh, children who are recurrently seen in the hospital may be at a greater risk from air pollution exposures. Then the next task is to look at effect modification by uh, sociodemographic factors, like SES. So I just want to point out that uh, part of task, task two was funded by the AQMD. Okay, task one. Now, uh, Professor Kleeman will take over. Thanks, Ralph. So I'm just using the laptop. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to come and uh, talk about some of our research collaborations and results today. Um, as Ralph introduced, we are trying to uh, estimate exposures to air pollutants. Um, and we're uh, going to be working at the scales that regional chemical transport models can use. Uh, so this will be done at kilometer scales, not uh, hundreds of meters scales, as Ralph was showing in the, the last diagram. That's a whole set of other model calculations that we didn't do for this project, uh, and there are other techniques to get at that. Uh, this was really a um, collaboration that started uh, the confluence of, of a couple of different complementary projects. And so we had an EPA project already to try to estimate uh, these exposure fields for the period 2000 through 2006 in California, as well as the eastern United States. Uh, and we extended that slightly to, to work with this project. Uh, this data set has now been used uh, in, I think, four or five EPI studies now. This one, uh, the Women's Health Initiative study, um, the um, a study on um, uh, birth weight, uh, and then a study on uh, carotid intima media thickness as well. So uh, we're hoping that this is a useful data set for lots of different applications. The overall framework for how we created this then was a, a chemical transport modeling exercise, what you would do for the SIP, uh, but trying to take a very detailed chemical model and, and really trying to do it for a long, long time period. We don't often model almost a decade for SIP purposes, but we did for this purpose to try to build up these exposure fields. And so we were trying to uh, recreate the meteorology that happened over almost a decade uh, using uh, weather research and forecast model. This is the model that's routinely used now to try to predict the, the wind fields, the temperature fields, and whatnot that you need to do the air pollution analysis. And then we took emissions inventories that were provided by the state of California, and we were very careful then to look at size fractions, as Ralph said. That's one of the things that's not really scrutinized right now in the SIP type analysis, but we have size and composition profiles for all the major sources. We've been measuring them from over a decade. And so we can predict the emissions of ultrafine particles by stamping those source profiles onto the regulatory emissions inventory, and we did that in this process. We also, of course, want to retain enough chemical information to be able to support the range of chemical mechanisms that we want to look at the data with, and so we, we speciated everything as well. Now, the initial focus was to try to do this at 36 kilometer resolution over the whole country, and then nest it down to 12 and to four kilometer resolution. As I'll show in a second, we, we actually just kind of jumped to the point. For various regions, reasons, this project kind of pivoted towards California and we, we focused on California, and so we changed the game plan a little bit. But as Ralph indicated, the, you know, why our model, why not just use CMAC for this purpose? Because we, for years, have tried to build into our model 
instrumentation so that we can still identify different size fractions of particles, uh, different sources of particles in the atmosphere, both primary particles and those that have gone through a chemical reaction system. So we can track the sources of secondary organic aerosol through our framework using the various mathematical techniques that we've baked into it over the years. All of that stuff is filtering into CMAC. More and more we see CMAC with features now that can do these sorts of things. In, in five or 10 years, CMAC will probably be able to do this. We'll be on to something else by that point. But, but all of this is maturing and advancing. And so this was an attempt to try to bring it uh, very, very early to an epi study and just see what we got. So these are the regions that we simulated in California. The, the blue border is a 24 kilometer domain, uh, 24 kilometer resolution. And then the red borders are two individual four kilometer domains. And it was just for pure computational expedience that we didn't do all of California at four kilometers. We're saving a lot of information. We're, we're chewing up a lot of cycles. This is already a supercomputing exercise. There are many, many terabytes of data that get uh, uh, sort of produced in this exercise. We, we extract you know, what we uh, talk about with our epi colleagues and, and uh, take only a very small fraction of that. But there's a wealth of information there. Uh, and it, it just it becomes burdensome to do the whole state. We chose these domains because this is where 93% of California's population lives. And so if you want to look at health studies, these are the, the two domains in red that you should focus on first and foremost. Now, all the dots that are here are the monitoring data. And I'll have a big focus on trying to compare our results to the measured concentration. Now, formally, this is what all of the, the health studies were based on, were measurements. Uh, and you can see we have a lot of measurements in California, but the idea is that there are spatial gradients that those measurements don't pick up. There are one in three measurements typically or one in six measurements, and there are time signals that they don't pick up. And the idea with the model is to try to interpolate in the most scientifically rigorous way possible between those measurement stations. Now, that's not to say that the measurements in any way drive our model calculations. The model calculations are compared to the measurements as a way of trying to get some confidence that the model is doing the right thing for the right reasons. If they don't match, we don't somehow go and turn a knob and try to tune them. What we do is we go back and we examine our fundamental assumptions and try to figure out what's broken, find an independent data set to fix it so the emissions were coded wrong in San Joaquin County or something like that, find a way to try to fix that independent of the, the measured concentrations, and then go back and once we have the revised estimates, see if we do any better. And just keep repeating on that until we think the model calculation is, is realistic. That's very, very different than model tuning. And I want to emphasize, we're using the measurements only as that validation exercise not to tune these models. Now, um, that being said, if we can match the measured concentrations at the measurement locations, our hope is that we are then doing well away from those measurement concentrations as well. So we, we have some confidence in the concentrations away from where the measurements were being taken. So our goal is to try to build up that confidence so that we feel that we can use the model results everywhere. And if we can't, then to know where we can't and to not put those into an epi study. So we've been very clear all along with our epi collaborators that we are gonna try to find out where the model doesn't work and we're gonna warn you about that so you don't put that into an epi study. Okay, so this is um, us comparing now to the measured concentrations. These plots are, these are standard plots if you're a chemical transport modeler and maybe not if you're uh, not used to looking at this data set. But essentially what we have here on the lower axis of each of these plots is a measured concentration in the units uh, for the variable indicated elemental carbon in the PM 2.5 size fraction, organic carbon in the PM 2.5 size fraction, micrograms per cubic meter along the lower axis here, nitrate, ammonia mines, sulfate, and then total PM 2.5 mass. What's shown on the vertical axis is the bias in the predicted concentrations for that variable. So we're comparing our model prediction now against the measured concentration at the sites where we have measurements. And we've done monthly mean averages here because you know, we've got 10 years of data and, and we think that uh, that's the most instructive way to look at this. Uh, we can do uh, daily to daily if we want to. It, it doesn't tell a significantly different picture. Uh, the, uh, the colors here correspond to the month of the year. So the hot summer months are coded in the hotter colors, the red, and then the cooler months, uh, the winter, are, are in the blue. And you can try to spot trends here. Are things working all the time or are things broken in certain areas? What you'd ideally like to see is that all the dots fall on the zero line. That would be perfect model performance, which of course uh, you would know that we cheated uh, because you, you, you just don't have the ability to predict all of those events over a 10 year period. Things happen that aren't in the routine inventories. Things happen that the, the meteorological model couldn't pick up. 
So of course we're not perfect, but, but you hope to see something clustering around. What you typically observe is that you can do better at the higher concentrations, and as concentrations go lower and lower, your fractional error gets bigger, so that your percentage error is gonna get larger. The way that this is constructed, uh, it normalizes by the average of the model predicted and the observed concentrations, uh, and then the um, vertical, the, the numerator in the calculation is the difference between the model predicted and the um, observed concentrations. What that means is that uh, it can go anywhere from zero to two, plus or minus two is where the answer falls. Zero would be perfect agreement. So what we see is um, that for elemental carbon, we're actually doing pretty well. The, the dashed lines are sort of the theoretical bounds for what you would expect a model with four kilometer resolution to be able to do, given that the monitoring sites are sometimes kind of close to the highways, maybe even closer than four kilometers to the highways. And you're not gonna be able to really pick up spatial gradients at that scale unless you drill down to hundreds of meters, which is again an even bigger supercomputing exercise, which we did not embark on for this project. So for elemental carbon, we're very pleased with that level of performance. For organic compounds, as Professor Delfino uh, mentioned, a, a real focus for this, uh, we've got some issues. And we knew that we had issues going on. There's a huge, uh, vigorous scientific debate going on right now in the atmospheric modeling community about the right way to represent organic compounds in models. Uh, what the dominant mechanisms are. There's a lot of theories that are out there, a lot of new mechanisms being tested. Some of them are constrained. Uh, some of them have a lot of free parameters and people are making best estimates for those free parameters and marching ahead. Uh, and you would be surprised, but even some of the things working their way into regulatory models have a lot of degrees of freedom, which are just best estimates, not necessarily constrained by measurements, direct measurements right now. And so there's a lot of things that are happening here. And I'll go into detail on the organics part of it shortly, but, but we decided that, um, you know, when we embarked on this three or four years ago, the safest thing to do was to do these calculations with the regulatory framework. So we used EPA's CMAC 4.7 SOA model in all of these calculations, uh, because we thought that that was the safest way to go right now. We're testing four or five different new techniques at Davis, and we've sort of figured out the problems with some of them. We are focusing on the most, uh, um, promising ones for the future, and, and this will be repeated with some of those new models, but for right now, this is what we have. So uh, we see some problems where we've got some under predictions of organic carbon uh, in some of the warmer months, uh, doing pretty well in the cooler months. The cooler months happen to have the highest concentrations because of wood smoke, which I'll show shortly. Um, but we, we're a little bit worried that we might be missing some of that organic aerosol the, uh, in the warmer season, especially the secondary organic aerosol. Uh, nitrate, we've got a mild under prediction, uh, and that mild under prediction gets a little bit worse as you get to lower concentrations. This was up through 2009. If you go beyond 2009, we've got fits, we've got big problems, and we're still trying to track those down, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, and then sulfate, we clearly have under prediction. Sulfate doesn't turn out to account for a lot of the PM 2.5 mass in California anymore. We've done a very good job of aggressively removing all the sulfur from our, our fuels. Uh, but it, it still does count for something and we are under predicting it. Uh, and we think that there are just missing sources or mechanisms in this. If you add all of this up and look at the PM 2.5 mass overall, uh, we're doing pretty well, but it's important to understand, you know, there's strengths and weaknesses in that overall PM 2.5 mass signal. So I can do the same thing for fractional error. And, and now instead of having the absolute concentration, or it's got the absolute concentration, the absolute difference between the predicted versus the measured rather than the, the difference with the sign. Uh, so it could be positive or negative. Now it always has to be positive. And this is just telling roughly the same story. And these are just model performance criteria again. And, and as I said, you know, we got some issues for organic compounds, especially in the warmer months. Uh, we've got some mild uh, issues for nitrate, uh, definitely in the warmer months, but even in the cooler months, which is really concerning at the higher concentrations for nitrate. And then sulfate's got issues in the summer months as well. For it, It's basically telling the same story. Okay, so... Um, Looking at averaging time, what's the right averaging time to use for these exposure fields? The model predicts at hourly time resolution, uh, or we save it at hourly time resolution. It predicts at second by second time resolution. If we cared to save it at that time resolution, we could. Uh, but you know, second by second doesn't make sense when you're, you're trying to predict a four kilometer grid cell. You know, that averaging time doesn't make any sense with respect to the spatial distance, so hourly maybe makes more sense there, but, but even hourly is problematic when you're trying to do a 10 year period. I've done you know, three day or three week modeling periods where we spend multiple years just trying to model those three days or those three weeks, and we pour enormous resources into checking the MET fields, to checking the emissions, to doing all of that, and, and we can get very good hourly results when we do that. 
in a, over a 10 year period, that's just not a practical exercise. And, and we didn't attempt to do that here. And so what you have to do is be realistic about what your annual average emissions inventory or your seasonally averaged emissions inventory can really represent. Did it catch that car crash on I-5 on Tuesday? Probably not. Did it catch the fact that you know, something weird happened in other parts of the emissions inventory? It might not even have Thanksgiving in there. Uh, you know, the holidays might not even be in there. And so you've gotta be a little bit realistic about what it can and can't do. So we looked at the mean fractional bias and the mean fractional error, those same metrics that I was looking at before. I'm just adding them up over all the seasons now, uh, but I'm looking at different averaging times, whether daily, monthly, or annual. And what we tend to see is that the performance of the model uh, generally improves for a lot of variables as you increase the averaging time. And what that said to us is that we were right to not try attempt hourly. Uh, maybe even daily might be a little bit dangerous. Uh, weekly uh, or, or monthly starts to be more realistic, we feel like, for this data set. And certainly annual is, but that only lends itself to certain things. Uh, the studies where you're looking at spatial variability in exposure, not time variability. And so for this project, we were very interested in trying to push the limits as much as we could for the time variation of the signal, because that was the signal that was useful for this. Uh, and so we, we, know, we think that you know, as you get to those weekly time scales, uh, well, I mean, even daily did okay, but, but you're definitely doing better if you go to longer averaging times. Question? So um, the question was for ozone, you see it being a little bit positive, a little bit negative, and then a little bit positive as you change the averaging time. I mean, my uh, take on all of that is that, um, you know, that's essentially very good performance for ozone and it, it works at all those scales. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I am personally thrilled with ozone. The fact that it's dancing positive, negative, but those are very, very small numbers. I think that's wonderful. Right, and, and so that's a mean fractional bias. That's already normalized, and so that's a very small number. You know, you're looking at something plus or minus 0.05 or 0.1. So that's a, that's a great metric for ozone. Um, something like nitrate, or certainly sulfate, uh, where you can see the clear consistent bias, uh, and it doesn't go away with longer average time. We, we've got emissions inventories or mechanism problems in there. So, you know, certainly uh, sulfate might be something of interest to our epi colleagues, but we just don't feel like we are doing a great prediction for that. We're missing major sources, and, and I would caution anyone using this data set that that's not an appropriate metric to look at at this point in time. We need to go back and fix that before we're ready to look at that. But other things like elemental carbon or perhaps even organic compounds, uh, we think that we are doing okay on. Ozone looks like we're doing really well on. So this is just some time series over the nine year modeling period that we're looking at. These are again monthly averages, uh, so 12 points per year spanning the nine year period. Uh, and you can see again that uh, we got different sites here, Sacramento, Fresno, Bakersfield, Los Angeles, and Riverside uh, for different um, chemical species now, gas phase NO on the left, uh, gas phase ozone on the right. Uh, and you know we're getting the seasonal signal uh, quite well matching the magnitudes of the peaks decently. It's not to say that everything's perfect everywhere. There's definitely data gaps, but again, over a 10 year period, you just don't have the time and resources to go back and chase everything. Uh, the same sort of plot now, same format for elemental carbon in the particle phase and nitrate in the particle phase. Again, the seasonality being picked up quite well. Uh, some problems in picking uh, absolute peaks in, in places like Los Angeles. You know, this might be uh, grid resolution issues or it might be emissions inventory issues. Uh, and then we've got nitrate over here, uh, doing pretty well in Sacramento, uh, pretty well in Fresno. Bakersfield, you know, um, we worry that we're missing some emissions of volatile organic compounds that might be driving some daytime chemistry that isn't in the model inventory. Uh, I mean, every one of these things has a story behind it. That's a subject of months of study and, and long discussions between us and ARB and on the whole monitor, modeling community. So there's, there's a lot of detail here that we're, we're glossing over. We're just trying to present the things that we think work right into this calculation. Okay, so just some idea about the spatial variability of these things then. Uh, looking at the predicted PM 2.5 mass on the upper left here, uh, high concentrations. The, the key here is in the observation panel. Uh, and so 28 micrograms per cubic meter, it's the same key for each paired set top and bottom. Uh, all the dots represent the measurements that I pointed to earlier in the, the uh, spatial fields that we're predicting. Uh, and so you got a lot of measurements uh, with high concentrations in Los Angeles. Uh, that correspond to a high peak uh, around the, the model predictions. I'm trying to coax my mouse to come back here. 
In fact, neither it is. Uh, so you see the, the high red here in Los Angeles measurements and then the high red here. Uh, San Joaquin Valley, more of an orangey sort of lukewarm. We're actually getting high predictions here, so uh, a little bit higher than the measured concentrations. You get things out here like this single red dot. You know, that's an improved site at a campground probably someplace. And you know, there's local phenomena happen. People light wood fires and things like that. That improved monitor goes off. I mean, they try to do a pretty good job citing these things, but you know, we can't necessarily predict everything that happens. These are nine year averages. And so I assume that wasn't a wildfire. That was actually some sort of a, a routinely high. I don't think it's in a, close to a town there, I, but I haven't actually looked where that thing is, that red dot up uh, north of Tahoe. So we can do this uh, not only for PM 2.5 mass, but for elemental carbon and organic compounds. And again, you know, we, we're generally looking for the correspondence in the predicted nine year average spatial fields to the measurements. Uh, and you know, this has gone through a lot of uh, rigorous analysis and we, we feel that it's doing pretty well. Uh, nitrate again, we think we're under predicting slightly, but we're doing decently on. So you see the peaks in the San Joaquin Valley and uh, to the east of the Los Angeles Air Basin. Sulfate, um, you know, we don't have a lot in California and we're under predicting it uh, in the model predictions. Uh, there's some sort of source around Southern California that we just don't have any inventory, I feel. Uh, and that, that needs to be reconciled at some point, especially as concentrations come down and that two or three micrograms of sulfate starts to be a bigger and bigger relative fraction of what's left over. And then ammonia is, ammonium is just chasing the nitrate and the sulfate. So it's the sort of the average of what those other two things are doing. Okay, so the big focus here is the organic compounds. And so I wanna spend some, some extra time trying to scrutinize that. And so what we're looking at in the top panel is the amount of the PM 2.5 mass that's explained by organic compounds, OC. That's the relative fraction. The crosses are measured concentrations at these sites, Sacramento, San Jose, Fresno, and Bakersfield. So measured at Sacramento, something around 0.45, uh, at San Jose, something around closer to 0.4, and then sort of creeping down uh, Los Angeles, Riverside, El Cajon. The model calculations is the bars. And so um, we can either do the bars with or without the dust. We know that we've got a dust emissions inventory problem. Right now, the dust emissions are coded without any wind speed effect. Uh, if it rains, then you cut the dust by 90%, but otherwise it doesn't care if the wind's blowing high or low. It's just the same dust emissions rate all the time. But that tends to fumigate you in the stagnation events. And so we tend to predict too much dust in these model predictions. And so that always has to be accounted for until we get a more sophisticated dust model. There's better models out there right now that have been used to model you know, dust entrainment events off Gobi Desert and things like that. Uh, those things tend to really pick up the severe events, but they haven't really been uh, fine-tuned yet for moderate events in California. And so we, we haven't had a lot of success applying some of those models in California for a more sophisticated dust episode uh, prediction. So at this point, we just have to be aware that dust introduces some uncertainty. So if I take out dust, then I get the light dashed rectangles as opposed to the solid rectangles, which ups our average slightly. So what you're seeing is that, you know, uh, we, we don't claim to have all the answers for predicting secondary organic aerosol in this model calculation. But even without that, we're doing pretty well. And you know, if you're following this debate in the literature or in, at the meetings, uh, you know, there's a East Coast discussion and there's a West Coast discussion. They're almost different discussions. I mean, East Coast is completely dominated by biogenics, the emissions from vegetation, and, and that's a very different SOA production system than California, which we're in a Mediterranean climate. We, we still have isoprene and other emissions from biogenics, but it's not dominant the way that it is there. We're dominant by cars and, and primary organic aerosol. And, uh, you know, everything that we've done to the best of our ability uh, suggests that there's a big chunk of primary organic aerosol contributing to the organic matter that's in the particles in the atmosphere. Uh, that may or may not age in the atmosphere. It may get more oxygenated. Certainly measurements with the AMS and things like that suggest that it does. Uh, but, you know, I think that by and large, we're close in terms of predicting the, the right amount of organic carbon to total mass, uh, whether or not our, our mechanisms are complete or not. If I look at the lower plot here, this is the same thing just in the ultrafine fractions. We don't have routine monitoring for the ultrafine size fraction. So these are all special events that we're listing in the lower panel here, the intensive studies that were done by my group or Costa Ciotis's group or, or others. Uh, and, and we're doing even better in that ultrafine size fraction for the amount of the, uh, of the mass that's accounted for by organic compounds. Okay, so focusing a little bit more on the SOA, um, We've got uh, two predictions in the upper panel here. Um, one is the model prediction, which is the right pair of each of the, the bars. Uh, and the dark is the POA and the, the hatch pattern is the SOA. And then the, the left pair in each of the bars 
is a uh, measured uh, POA to SOA split based on, uh, I think this was the, the EC uh, sort of technique for apportioning how much of the uh, compounds are primary versus secondary, how much were emitted directly from a combustion source versus produced in the atmosphere by gas phase reactions. And you know what we're seeing is that there definitely is um, a larger amount of um, secondary organic aerosol that is predicted uh, using the measured concentrations versus our regional chemical transport model. Our regional chemical transport model is predicting that 90 plus percent of the organic matter is primary and only uh, five or to 10 percent of it is secondary. And that is uh, different than what the measurements say. Now, our response to all of this is that we think that some of that primary organic aerosol is aging in the atmosphere. It might age in the particle phase or it might go you know, into the gas phase briefly, age there and then come right back to the particle phase. But for whatever reason, that primary stuff picks up oxygen and then all these measurement techniques would count it as secondary organic aerosol, even though it started out as a primary and just sort of chemically reacted. So we think that we're not picking up that subtlety in the model calculations. And to the degree that that matters for asthma, we're gonna be blind to that until the community sort of figures out what we're doing on this question. Uh, and, and as I say, there's a lot of scientific debate out there right now, lots of people trying lots of different models, some of them very unconstrained, uh, but they're trying a lot of different things and, and you'll get more and more data sets to try this out on. Uh, so I have to caveat all this, but uh, that's honestly how the calculation work. And then in, in the lower panel here, I'm doing the same thing. Um, I'm predicting the model SOA now. It's just SOA in the, in the bottom, just no POA. So if I took this little bar up here and just plotted it separately, it's something less than one microgram. That's what's on the far right here. And then the first two plots are different measurement techniques for estimating SOA. One of them being the EC apportionment method and the other one being just a chemical mass balance calculation to predict all the POA sources. And then whatever's left over by definition must be SOA. And I, I believe this is Ralph's data actually. Yeah. Oh. Right, uh, but you were on the team that measured all this, right, exactly. Uh, so, um, you know, again, we're doing pretty well in some places and, and uh, under predicting by this technique in other places, but we think really what's going on is some of that primary organic aerosol is just chemically reacting and getting counted as secondary organic aerosol in the measurements. And uh, that is a subtlety we're not picking up yet. So of the SOA that we are predicting, we, we believe that those few micrograms that we are predicting are real. Uh, they're following logical chemical mechanism. We might not be explaining at all, but we think what we are, ex are predicting is real. And so if we're looking at the total secondary organic aerosol uh, being predicted over this nine year period in California, uh, the highest concentrations are actually in the San Joaquin Valley. We're getting uh, somewhere around 0.6 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, and then we can look at all the different uh, pathways that it followed. So the, the long chain alkanes, the xylenes, the toluene, the benzene, the isoprene, monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes coming from the biogenic sources again. And then you've got this thing, oligomer A and oligomer B. In the EPA mechanism for secondary organic aerosols, everything ages to a very non-volatile product over some time scale. And all of the anthropogenic sources age to oligomer A, and all of the biogenic sources age into oligomer B, basically. And it's just this thing that uh, all of the semi-volatile stuff ages into and it's essentially non-volatile. It's never coming back from that at that point. It can dry deposit or it can sort of get diluted in the atmosphere, but it's never gonna evaporate again once it hits those oligomer uh, things. This is kind of a, it was the best attempt to try to represent what's happening in the atmosphere at the time that it was written, you know, some years ago now. Uh, and again, there are more sophisticated things that you can do to try to predict this and, and we're doing some of them, uh, but um, this is what state of the science at the time that the project was done. Uh, and then you've got the predicted sources of POA. Remember the POA is accounting for 90% in our calculations at least of the organic aerosol that's the, at the center of some of the hypotheses of this project. And so where's that stuff coming from? And so we've got on-road gasoline, off-road gasoline, on-road diesel, off-road diesel, wood smoke, a very clear and large signal, especially in the winter time, very isolated around some of the urban locations where uh, wood is used to, to heat homes in the winter time. Uh, food cooking is a big source. I just uh, looked at the ultrafine inventory the other day trying to figure out what the spatial circuits are. We're trying to get to one kilometer resolution and uh, food cooking is one of the top three sources of ultrafine particles and so we need to find those food cooking spatial circuits at one kilometer resolution very, very urgently. Uh, wood, wood burning is the other one for ultrafine particles. So some of these things are, are very important. Uh, traffic sources are gonna be uh, obviously critical in here as well. So lots of seasonal variation. Uh, this is looking at the primary organic aerosol signal, the, the uh, dots or the measurements 
Uh, and then the, um, the colors are the model predictions. Uh, the wood burning signal comes in very strongly. That's the yellow that you see, comes in very strongly in the wintertime. So by and large, the highest concentrations of organic aerosols that you see in California happen in the wintertime, and they're driven by biomass combustion, by wood burning. Uh, and so that's, that's a pretty clear signal, at least in Northern California. In Los Angeles, maybe not so much, uh, more of a, not that same level of spiking uh, happening. Food cooking uh, obviously being uh, very important in Southern California, that's the hatch pattern there. If you look at the Los Angeles, the food cooking signal is the, the hatch pattern. Uh, so um, different, I guess, characteristic sources for different regions. Uh, a, a lot of this uh, important in both the PM 2.5 and the PM 0.1 size fraction. So I, I wanna hand it back to Ralph, but just make a quick pitch. I mean, we've got it in five epi studies right now. It's free, it's up on the website. If you wanna do epi on this, uh, download it. Uh, we didn't make it hard to use on purpose, but it is a little bit hard to use because we didn't take the time to really make it completely user friendly. Uh, we've got tools, we've, we've given it to four or five partners now, so hopefully that's smoothed off some of the rough edges, but if you have questions, just email me, I'm happy to have you use it. We burned a lot of carbon producing these results, and I would be very, very happy if we get everything that we can out of them. So if you wanna use these exposure fields, please feel free to take them. So with that. Okay, is my mic on? Okay, great. Okay, so moving on to the second task of this project. It has two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that long-term, and by long-term here I'm referring to six-month seasonal, so warm season and cool season, long-term residential exposure to, to trap in children with asthma will increase the risk of hospital asthma, encounter, a, asthma hospital encounters from short-term increases in ambient air pollution. So in other words, it's an effect modifier of the typical relationship that time series studies looks at, which is the association between asthma admissions and ambient air pollution. So the rationale for this hypothesis hedges on two things, vulnerability and susceptibility. So the first one, vulnerability. So if you recall the slide that I showed you before with the air inversion, the stagnant air and the air inversion, uh, that's, uh, that's what we expect to occur uh, at, a, at greater uh, intensity near busy traffic. So there'll be higher concentrations of pollution, pollution near busy traffic um, than say in a suburban area. Um, so the first, kind of the first evidence of this came from a study at the University of Washington uh, published by Norris et al. Uh, back in 2000. And they found that surface temperature inversions and air stagnation were correlated with increased concentrations of air pollutants, particularly in the winter. And that these air stagnation events were themselves associated with asthma hospital admissions. So when, when I thought about designing this study, I remember that because I remember them presenting that uh, when I was up there in Seattle once. And I thought, wow, no one's really done anything with this uh, since then. And uh, particularly, no one has done anything with this on a fine spatial scale, okay? This particular study, in fact, was just, you know, uh, 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 air stagnation regionally, so regional air stagnation. Um, they, and it was a time series kind of study as well, so there was no individual level spatial data. Um, so again, the point is that we think that homes near dense traffic are expected to be most affected under these conditions of air stagnation. Okay, so the second point is that chronic uh, exposure to traffic-related air pollution may increase susceptibility uh, by inducing a more chronic level of airway inflammation uh, in an asthmatic uh, subject. So they become more susceptible to air pollution because their asthma is worse and it takes less for them to be driven into an asthma exacerbation uh, than would otherwise be the case. The second hypothesis is that asthma morbidity will be additively associated with primary and secondary air pollutants, uh, whether they be aerosols or, or gases. And the rationale here is that, first of all, uh, in the study that, in the, in the data that um, 
that Mike showed uh, from that USC and University of Wisconsin generated, uh, we saw very little correlation between markers of, of SOA and markers of POA. Um, very little or no correlation. Um, so combine that with the, uh, with, with the expectation that both of these things will be driving asthma. The primary pollutants because of their toxicity and their, their ability to, to generate inflammation and oxidative stress. And secondary organic aerosols because they're already oxidized and they're, they're known to, to induce oxidative stress in experimental systems. So they ought to be doing that in the airways. And uh, in a previous study we did, a cardiovascular study, we found, uh, we found that uh, SOA, again, measured that way using tracers, uh, was associated with airway inflammation as measured by exhaled nitric oxide. Um, whereas primary organic aerosols were not. So, so that, that, was, uh, that was an inspiration for us to, to continue looking at this, particularly in a, in a disease where, uh, where airway oxidative stress and inflammation are key, which is asthma. So this study uh, is it's related to time series studies, but it's a case crossover study in that each person acts as their own control, basically. And so subject characteristics that would otherwise be confounders are controlled for by design. Uh, char those characteristics, however, are of interest as they are in, our, in two of our tasks because they might modify the associations uh, between your exposure and your outcome. So the exposures are sampled from every subject's time-varying distribution of exposure. And I'll show you that in more detail later. And so the exposure of interest is the time just before the hospital admission or the ED visit. And then we compare that to a referent or a control time period within the same four-week moving average period and the same days of the week. So it looks something like, um, like oh well, where is it? Oh, it comes later. Okay, so let's go on to population. So we're looking at all hospital admissions and ED visits for primary diagnosis of asthma in Northern Orange County of age for the nine-year period of 2000, 2008. Two hospitals in North Orange County uh, were used, Children's Hospital of Orange County, Chalk, and uh, the University of California Irvine Medical Center. Uh, currently, Chalk is the only children's hospital now, so all the, they're, they're part of, they're, they're collaborating with UCI, and so all the children go there now. Uh, but not during the earlier part of this, this study. So the hosp hospital catchment area is the urban core of Orange County, which is northern Orange County. So it's the urbanized area. Demographic characteristics. So we saw a total of, so this, this study uh, is comprised of a total of uh, over uh, 7,400 subjects um, who went to the hospital um, over 11,000 uh, different times. Uh, so that was over 8,000 emergency department visits and over 3,000 hospital admissions. So for a time series study, that's a very small sample size, right? For a case crossover study, it's, it's, not, it's not bad. That's, that's a fairly decent sample size. So the rest, the rest of the descriptive data here are percentages. As you can see, there's a majority of, of male subjects, which is what you'd expect uh, with asthma, uh, particularly in the younger age groups. Uh, also, as expected, a large number of kids zero to four years old uh, are seen in hospital with a diagnosis of asthma. Um, sometimes those diagnoses, diagnoses are not accurate uh, because it's very difficult to diagnose asthma in uh, preschool children. Uh, nevertheless, we, we're looking at them. The pointer is a little hard to use here. Here we go. Um, so the next highest group is 5 to 12, and then the adolescents are the lowest percentage, uh, again, as expected. <coughs> so in this area of North Orange County, we have a very large uh, percentage, over half of uh, white um, Hispanics, uh, followed by uh, white non-Hispanics, and uh, actually very few other, other minority groups. Um, so our analysis of race ethnicity will focus on Hispanic versus non-Hispanic, uh, but will also include uh, other race ethnicities as well. Um, the, other thing, um, the other thing to point out is that um, a relatively small proportion of subjects had private insurance. So the majority had either uh, government, some kind of government-sponsored insurance, Medi-Cal or, or county insurance, or they were uninsured, uh, which before Obamacare was, uh, was uh, often the case. 
<laughs> exposure summary. So this is what we used. Um, again, we used the task one data from, from, uh, from Mike's group for SOA and POA, as well as the, um, as well as the source contributions uh, uh, for POA in three different uh, size bins, so ultrafine, PM2.5, and PM10. <laughs> we also looked at uh, weekly average concentrations of traffic dispersion models, or Caroline Ford dis dispersion model uh, pollutants, including CO, NOx, ultrafine particles, really particle number, and PM2.5. Um, Really throughout, I'll just be talking about NOx instead of NOx and CO because the results were fairly similar for the, for the two, so we're simplifying the presentation and just showing NOx, UF, PM, PM2.5, so weekly average. And then to look at effect modification by the location of the subject by season, we did, uh, again, a dispersion model, but averaged it over six months at each residential address. So the two six-month seasons here are May through October for the warm season and November to April for the cool season. So for the exposures, uh, residential addresses for each hospital encounter were geocoded, and we linked those addresses to the nearest amber ambient monitoring station. Uh, there was one for PM 2.5 at Anaheim, Anaheim, and then four stations for the gases. And then we also linked it to, to uh, Mike's 4.4 uh, four four by 4 kilometer grid for the uh, uh, for the POA and SOA data. <coughs> so um, we took traffic data for uh, major roads and highways and linked them to the home locations and then used uh, Jun Wu, our co-investigator, used a Caline 4 dispersion model to estimate seven-day average as well as a six-month seasonal uh, PM 2.5, NOx, and particle number concentrations at each residence from local traffic ed 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 uh, emissions. Okay, I want to emphasize that because, you know, when we talk about uh, Caline 4 model PM 2.5, we're only talking about PM 2.5 from traffic emissions, okay, not from other sources. So the concentrations, of course, would be far lower than you would see, say, at an ambient site measuring PM 2.5. So we focus primarily um, here on, uh, on sources in a 500-meter uh, radius buffer. Uh, but I'll present some results also using a 1500 meter buffer as well. Uh, we did do uh, land use regression. Uh, Junwoo did a land use regression modeling for uh, NOx, but I'm not going to discuss it here uh, because we just don't have enough time. So here's the Caline 4 uh, dispersion model. Um, probably familiar with the Gaussian plume model for line sources, which would be highways. Uh, and these are the various uh, inputs traffic patterns, emission factors, roadway geometry, and meteorology. Specifically, the model inputs were uh, local traffic emissions of gas and diesel uh, vehicles within this 500-meter uh, radius buffer, uh, which took in you know, traffic volumes and, and all of that, as well as meteorology. So because of the dispersion model, obviously wind is, is critically important, um, as well as temperature. So the emission factors um, uh, for the pollutants came from uh, ARB's MFAC 2007 vehicle emission model. Uh, however, the emission factors for, for the ultrafine particles were developed uh, by Jun Wu uh, and published uh, here. This is the publication where they talked about their model. I'll show you that later, the performance of that model. Um, so for traffic activity on freeways and highways, uh, she had to use a, uh, a temporally crewed input, which was annual average traffic count um, from, from the Caltrans PEMS. Uh, as well as weight and motion data at selected locations. So surface streets, uh, she used Caltrans uh, annual average traffic uh, counts again. And uh, so uh, what she then did to get the uh, temporal resolution down to daily, and then we averaged to seven days and, and six months, uh, was to scale the freeway, highway, and surface street data uh, to diurnal and day of week traffic variation profiles either on the freeway or highway, because we had that data, or if it was a surface street, to the nearest freeway. Okay, so that's, that's, as, that's really as good as it, as, as it gets. Um, so this is, this is the model performance for the uh, particle number concentration um, using freeways, using actual particle number data on freeways in California uh, and Texas. So on the left is, is uh, two California freeways, the 405 and 710. And these are two freeways in Texas, uh, 973 and, and I-35. 
And as you can see here, the correlation is not too bad. It's the, the correlation is uh, between, uh, 0.97, between 0.92 and 0.99. So quite, quite good. Good performance. And this is just, this is just showing a nine-year average Krieged uh, concentration of Caline 4 NOx in the, in the target area, um, sort of showing the obvious higher concentrations around, around freeways. So the statistical analysis, uh, as I said, this is a case crossover design, and parameter estimates are uh, uh, obtained through conditional logistic regression. So that way, time invariant subject specific characteristics are controlled for by design, because each subject is their own control. So exposure seven days prior um, to the event, which would be the hospital admission or the ED visit, is compared to two seven-day reference periods. And this shows it right here. Now it's gone. Okay, let's skip that arrow there. Okay, so this is the exposure period. So day zero would be the event time, so the admission or the ED visit. We're interested in exposure in the last seven days, so lag six day through day zero, lag zero. And then we select one of two reference periods, either in the future, so skipping a week and a week in the future, and, and if, or in the past, skipping a week and then another week in the past. So this moves with each day of study. So this is called a semi-symmetric bidirectional reference selection method. So the, how, how did we select the reference period? So we randomly select one of those two reference periods, but sometimes there's only one reference period available, either because it's the beginning of the study or the end of the study, uh, and that occurred in about 1.6% of the time. So in that case, we inserted an offset term into the regression model. Um, this method, if you're interested, uh, really is equivalent to uh, the other uh, case crossover design that a lot of people use, which is called the time stratified method. The difference being that uh, our four-week window moves, whereas the time stratified method just selects it by month. And, and personally, I find that hard to, hard to think of its relevance to, to uh, biological outcomes because, you know, Human biology does not really recognize months. Okay, time is time is continuous. So, so just you know, I, I really like the other the method method that we use rather than the time stratified method, and and it is statistically equivalent. So uh, in general, this avoids bias from time trends. So day of week and and season essentially. So we tested models stratified by by the six month seasons because of differences in pollutant composition. Uh, for example, ozone, we just looked at the warm season because there's, there's very little uh, ozone in the uh, six months uh, of the cool season. So we tested the estimates um, across, uh, like I said, a seven-day period, and I'm showing one day, three day, five day, and seven day, just for ease of, of presentation. Uh, and we found when we tested models for ED visits separate from hospital emissions, the results were very, very similar. So we combined the two to increase statistical power. We adjusted for temperature and relative humidity of the same lag average as the air pollutant. And we adjusted for within correlation, within subject correlation where a subject had repeated visits. Uh, and so there was lack of, lack of uh, independence in, in a regression model. We did that with a robust variance estimator. <coughs> so uh, to test the, <coughs> excuse me, to test hypothesis one, we tested <coughs> effect modification by six month seasonal average uh, Caline for residential trap by stratifying the subjects above and below the median, basically to, to have an adequate sample size, the median of the Caline for dispersion model pollutant. <coughs> and then we looked at the effect modification of that on ambient air pollution. And we did that with a product term, basically a product term. And we considered that to be significant at a p-value of p less than 0.1, which is pretty standard, a nominal p-value of 0.1 for the product term. So we standardized all regression results by the interquartile range, that is the 25th to 75th percentile, so that we could uh, you know, basically put all the pollutants on equal footing when we're comparing them. So some of the uh, informal comparisons, if you will, are to compare um, the uh, data from uh, UC Davis for POA versus SOA and the various uh, particle size fractions of POA. 
as, as well as the POA source contributions uh, from different sources that, that Mike just discussed. Um, we also com compared the CalLine 4 uh, estimated seven-day average traffic-related air pollutants um, to the ambient air pollutants, particularly the uh, primary gases like CO and NOx. Um, so a more formal comparison was to actually do multi-pollutant models. So we would enter two pollutants into the same model and see how the estimates for each pollutant changed from their, their uh, uh, single pollutant model. Okay? And the, um, the entries for the two pollutants included the following. So we would enter a primary combustion-related air pollutant um, like UFP, POO, POA, excuse me, NOx or CO, and then we would enter a, a, a secondary air pollutant like ozone or SOA, basically. And that would be to test the second hypothesis, that the two associations uh, for primary and secondary pollutants would be independent, particularly the organic aerosol signal. <clears throat> we also wanted to see whether uh, ambient PM 2.5 mass or ozone were independent of SOA, particularly during the warm seasonal period. And whether PM, uh, PM 2.5 mass is independent of, of ozone. If you recall, I talked about that New York study, and we wanted to see if we could see that here in California as well. So now results. So uh, the first publication of, of the results has come out, and that was published last year in Epidemiology right here, Effect Modification by Residential Traffic-Related Air Pollution. So basically, we focused on testing the first hypothesis. So this shows the results of, of that. Um, so in each graph that I'm going to show you, I'm showing it for a, a particular ambient air pollution during one of the two seasons, the six-month cool season or the six-month warm season. Um, the x-axis is the uh, estimate effect, which here is the percent change, the percentage change in the level of hospital encounters. And then for, uh, for each pollutant, I'm going to show the effect modification. First by showing uh, in the first area the association uh, for the ambient air pollution across all subjects. So no effect modification here, just a straight up, you know, uh, relationship between the ambient air pollution and the admission or ED visit. And then here we're showing the effect modification by three different approaches, again, to the CalLine 4 estimate, NOx, PM2.5, and ultrafine particles. So here, as you can see, for the cool season, uh, looking at one day, three day, five day, and seven day averages, that there's a step function, basically. We're seeing a significant association with the longer uh, averaging times, five day and seven day, uh, across all subjects for carbon monoxide. So then if we look across here for effect modification, the triangles are uh, greater than uh, the median concentration of CalLine 4 trap. So I think you can immediately appreciate, uh, pr particularly I think it's clearest here for PM, CalLine 4 PM 2.5, uh, that the association is much stronger in subjects that are living near higher traffic density areas as indicated by the CalLine 4 uh, pollutant variable. And pretty, pretty consistent, uh, although maybe le not quite as dramatic for CalLine 4 NOx and UFP. So now if we go uh, to cool season uh, ambient NOx, uh, again, very similar picture uh, across all subjects. There seems to be a, a step function with stronger associations and significant ones for five and seven day average uh, NOx. And then if we look across at effect modification, clearly a higher, uh, a, a stronger association um, uh, for subjects who live in the upper half of, of exposure to traffic. Looking at PM 2.5, um, we see again, and, and just want to note the, uh, the scale here. It's not always the same. So the, these are, uh, uh, these, this is, scales a little bit lower. So you just have to take account of that. Um, so here we see PM 2.5, and we're seeing um, associations, again, similar kind of step function with uh, near significant and then significant associations for five and seven day average PM 2.5. Uh, don't really see any effect modification for CalLine 4 NOx, but we do for CalLine 4 PM 2.5, which is, which is interesting. And not so much for CalLine 4 uh, UFP, but, but it's still, you can still kind of see it there, but it's not a significant difference. Uh, going to the warm season now, 
We don't really see any association between CO and, and asthma in the warm season at all. Uh, and in terms of effect, of effect modification, none of these estimates are significant, even though you do see the expected separation in point estimates. Um, they're, not, they're not significantly different, and, uh, and none of these estimates are significant. So nothing going on in the warm season with CO. Um, exactly the same thing for NOx as well. No association in the warm season for NOx and no effect modification. However, PM 2.5 in the warm season is significant, in fact, across all averaging times from one day to seven days. And we do see effect modification. So the kids living in the uh, higher traffic-related uh, exposure areas are significantly more likely um, to go to hospital than, than those who are not. In fact, if you look at Caroline for Knox, uh, there's no association with PM 2.5 and that lower half of exposure, that lower, lower half of exposure population. So ve very, very obvious here. Um, looking at ozone, uh, strong significant associations. I think that scales a little bit off. This probably should be 40%. I'm not sure why that happened. But nevertheless, you can see these are, these are really large estimates of effect for ozone in the summertime. Um, and although I'm not gonna talk about it in the discussion, you know. It, a lot of California time series studies don't see an association with ozone on, on, an, on an acute or short-term uh, exposure response basis. Uh, but we are seeing it here. Looking at effect modification, what do we see? Completely the opposite. <laughs> so we see a significant association um, and a stronger association in kids who live in the lower exposure areas, lower Caline 4 uh, dispersion model areas. So totally the opposite for ozone. So very interesting finding, um, but not entirely unexpected because if you go out and measure ozone on the same day near uh, a busy traffic area, and then you go out, uh, even, even if the, the temperature is the same out into a suburban area, you're gonna find higher concentrations in the suburbs than by traffic because of neutralization of ozone by nitric oxide coming from traffic. So we think actually that, that uh, being near traffic is, is lowering your exposure to ozone and that we're picking that up here. And so in a way, it's, it's, it's further justifying this, this approach to analysis of ambient air pollute uh, associations. So we were actually very pleased to see this. This is, this is a, a very interesting result. You know, that contrast that for primary gases and PM 2.5. So here now we're looking at, um, this table is showing the association in the two seasons for the seven day average Caline 4 dispersion model pollutants. Uh, and again, keeping in mind, these are not the same as, as ambient air pollutants, they're traffic related, all of these, PM 2.5 NOx and particle number. Uh, one estimated using a 500 meter buffer the other at a 1500 meter buffer. And I think you can immediately appreciate uh, that all of the, all the significant positive associations are seen in the cool season and highlighted here in red uh, and really nothing in, uh, in the warm season. So this is very consistent with what we see for the ambient primary gases, uh, very consistent. The other thing to appreciate here um, is that the associations are stronger uh, when the dispersion model is estimated at 1,500 meters uh, than at 500 meters. Okay, now turning to the seven-day average um, uh, UCD CID model primary and secondary organic aerosol. We're gonna do this for each size fraction. In this table, we're looking at ultrafine particle, the ultrafine particle fraction. Uh, first thing to point out is uh, ultrafine SOA, no association. In fact, the, the, uh, this should be actually red because it's a significant inverse association in the warm season, completely the opposite of what we would have hypothesized. Um, so th that, was, um, that was surprising uh, and, and no association in the cool season. If we then turn to POA, again, uh, we see all of the significant positive associations in the cool season for all of these different sources, both for the total POA, so this is integrating all the different sources, uh, on-road, so we combine on-road gasoline and diesel exhaust 
um, because this, the effect estimates were similar when we, we, when we separated, so we combined them. Uh, very large effect estimates of 25% increased risk for an interquartile increase in ultrafine POA from on-road sources, uh, off-road sources uh, as well. Um, uh, noth uh, nothing really from uh, ultrafine wood smoke sources. Uh, meat cooking, surprisingly, came up. Very similar estimate from, from the other sources, including... Uh, so all of these are very similar in terms of magnitude, um, including high sulfur content fuel combustion and other anthropogenic sources. So let's look at PM 2.5. Uh, essentially consistent results with what we saw for the ultrafine particles. Basically, all the effects are seen in the cool season. And SOA, again, we're seeing uh, uh, inverse association or inverse or negative uh, estimates in, in both seasons. And in this case, now it's significant in the, in the cool season, surprisingly. Um, we do see, as expected, uh, an effect of wood smoke POA in the winter or in the cool season. Not quite as strong as the, uh, as the other sources, uh, but, it's, but it's there. Okay, and in this case, we see for PM 2.5, an association, the only association for POA in the warm season is for the POA from, from, from cooking sources. And we see that in the, in the winter, too. We see, see an association in the winter as, as well. <coughs> so very quickly, for PM 10, the, the estimates of association are almost identical to PM 2.5. And <coughs> as Mike has explained to me, it's because most of the PM, POA and PM10 is really fine fraction POA. So we're really just pulling in that, that same source, same set of, um, of concentrations uh, from the fine fraction. I think if I have that correct, yeah. <coughs> so this is, a, this is a summary in a way of what we've just seen, <coughs> but to make comparisons by, by size fraction, ultrafine, PM2.5 and PM10. <coughs> Highlighted in blue is, um, what appear to be the strongest associations. So I think just, just an overview of, of POA overall, as well as the different sources, you can see that, that the ultrafine fraction has, has generally the strongest, uh, strongest associations of, of, of the size fractions, uh, except for wood smoke, where you're seeing it uh, uh, only in, in the fine fraction and, and PM10, of course. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, except for POA from other anthropogenic sources, really can't tell the difference between PM 2.5 and ultrafine. And I just point out that you know these confidence intervals are quite wide, so the estimates do overlap. So it's not it's not necessarily significant uh, a significant difference in point estimate. So now moving on to two pollutant models, uh, this is a graph of two pollutant models of PM 2.5 and ozone in the warm season. Recall we did see significant associations for both. So you see in the first uh, in the first set of four uh, estimates we have three-day average, and the sec second set are the seven-day averages. So first we have uh, PM 2.5 alone, and then PM 2.5 with ozone, and we see just a, a slight decrease in in the level of association. Uh, same with ozone. So in the single pollutant model, it's here. Ozone with PM 2.5 is here, um, and we see basically. We see basically the same thing for the seven-day averages as well, showing that the association with PM 2.5 and ozone are, are largely independent of each other. There's some little bit of co-confounding there, as you would expect, because uh, there, there is some correlation there. Okay, so the other two pollutant models uh, that we looked at, we looked at warm season, uh, seven-day average PM 10 was either unchanged or actually increased when co-regressed with uh, the other uh, primary pollutants, either the, the POA or the primary gases or the Caline 4 estimated exposures. Well, that's not surprising because none of those were significant anyway. Uh, at least most of them were not significant, so there was no, no change in PM 2.5. However, <coughs> recall that um, the, the primary gases in POA and Caline 4 were significant in the cool season, and they did confound um, cool season PM 2.5. Okay, so in other words, they were, they were explaining some of the association with PM2.5 uh, PM in the cool season um, that was likely due to, to the primary components in PM2.5. 
Uh, so that was, that was what we would have, would have expected. Um, the warm season association of asthma with ambient ozone also was not confounded by anything, um, as expected, because there were no associations with SOA or POA or Calan 4 trap. So that, that wasn't surprising. So hypothesis two, in a way, we weren't able to truly test because ozone in the warm season uh, wasn't confounded because the other associations weren't significant. And SOA wasn't significant at all. So conclusions, positive associations of asthma morbidity with ambient air pollutants, particularly during the cooler season, is enhanced among subjects living near high traffic density areas. Okay? And therefore, the typical associations that we see in time series studies may be underestimates, particularly with regard to vulnerable, po vulnerable populations exposed to high levels of trap. Positive associations of asthma morbidity with ambient ozone in the warm season is enhanced in subjects with low levels of trap. Okay, and that's probably explained, as I said, by this equation here. NO plus ozone leads to NO2 plus O2. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting finding that's basically consistent with, with the effect modification on the other side with primary pollutants. Uh, both seven-day average Caline 4 trap and the UCD CID POA were positively associated with asthma encounters in the cool but not warm season, uh, the only exception being the meat cooking POA. Seven-day average Caline 4 particle number and PM 2.5 in the cool season were similarly associated with asthma morbidity, estimated at the 500 meter radius buffers. So again, these were uh, consistent, and then the associations of both were stronger at the 1500 meter uh, buffer, probably because they were taking in, the larger buffer was taking in other sources uh, at a greater distance from the subject's residence. Um, the POA estimates for all sources except wood smoke were more strongly associated with asthma morbidity in the ultrafine than, than in the PM2.5 and PM10 modes, although, as I said, the confidence intervals overlapped considerably. Interestingly, the positive associations for meat cooking were of similar magnitude to other sources. And we think, we think probably because the influence of meteorology in, in the model uh, probably uh, led to, to high correlations, which we see. The correlations basically were greater than 0.8 for all the other POA sources. Um, so it's, it's hard to know whether uh, the meat cooking POA is actually causal. Uh, or whether it's just because of the correlation with other sources. Okay, so multi-pollutant models, uh, our findings are consistent with the study in New York uh, by Silverman and Ito that ozone and PM2.5 are largely independent of each other. Um, also, the, the finding in the cool season of the primary pollutants uh, suggests that they're representative of causal PM components um, that aren't as well captured by just PM2.5 mass. However, in the warm season, nothing seems to be confounding PM2.5 mass. It stands alone. Um, so we would have expected, for example, if we had, if we knew what really what SOA, if we'd really measure SOA, then we would have expected SOA to confound PM2.5. But there was no association with SOA. So, so we still have this huge question mark. Uh, what's going on? What are the causal components of warm season fine particles in relation to asthma morbidity. We just, we still don't know. Okay, so let's go on uh, to task three. So the hypothesis here is that associations in task two would be stronger in subjects who had recurrent uh, hospital encounters because it's an indicator of increased asthma severity. And it's important because we wanna obviously decrease hospital utilization by any means, including lowering air pollution levels. So the forerunner to this uh, study was, was another study we did in uh, basically the same catchment area with the same uh, a group of hospitals uh, conducted from 2000 to 2003 where we found that, um, that subjects with higher level of Caline 4, uh, NO2 NOx, or mostly NOx and CO, were at significant increased risk for recurrent hospital admission. Okay. So that suggested that this was a population that was potentially 
more susceptible to ambient air pollution. Uh, not what we tested in that study, but that's what we're looking at here. So again, this is a case crossover analysis. Uh, in this case, stratified uh, by recurrence of hospital emission, either recurrent or no recurrence uh, within each subject. Uh, we did uh, change, the, uh, change the catchment area to be closer to the hospital because some subjects further away from the hospital might go to uh, the children's hospital down in South Orange or elsewhere. Um, so that was still about 83% of our population. Um, so basically we're comparing uh, associations for 4,823 subjects that only had one hospital encounter to 1,777 subjects with, one, with more than one uh, hospital mission or ED visit. So this is the catchment area, just very briefly, with the, the density of subjects around the two hospitals mapped out. And here are the results. So this is the warm season uh, results, um, looking at uh, both ambient air pollutants, so PM2.5, where is that mysterious arrow? PM2.5 ozone, NOx, as well as Caline 4 PM2.5. Uh, and the two, uh, the two UC Davis uh, secondary and, and primary organic aerosols. Um, so again, we didn't see any associations uh, down here for the warm season. And uh, for the ambient air pollutants, for, particularly for PM2.5 and ozone, as you recall, we found associations there. Um, although there were more significant associations, two, you know, three more significant associations for those with repeated encounters, uh, over in the far right column, there was, you can see there was no significant interaction or no difference between uh, the two groups. So particularly for ozone, you can see here there's, there's no difference at all uh, for, for ozone. So no effect modification there. Uh, again, the same thing for the cool season. <coughs> uh, although we see more significance among those with repeated encounters, there is no difference for those that don't have the repeated encounters. So for PM2.5, exactly the same estimate, uh, and really no difference uh, between the two here. So we conclude there's very limited evidence for a difference in association by recurrence, uh, even though some cool season models suggest an increased risk among the population with repeated vis visits, there's no significant uh, difference. So now moving on quickly to task four, um, we hypothesized that, again, associations in task two would be strongest among subjects without health insurance or with government-sponsored insurance <clears throat> and strongest in those with lower socioeconomic status. Um, and, and we hypothesized that racial, racial ethnic differences in association might be uh, due in part to these differences in SES. So this is, again, a case crossover model looking at effect modification using product terms. Uh, by both SES, as well as race, ethnicity, sex, and pediatric age group. And then <clears throat> finally, we looked at a three-way interaction model where we wanted to know whether uh, the finding in task two of effect modification by higher trap of the ambient air pollutants was um, possibly due to demographic characteristics. And the rationale for, th for this is that it could be that regional trap data could be functioning <clears throat> as a surrogate of demographic differences. We know that poor uh, families uh, live near higher traffic density. So which is it? You know, is it the traffic density or is it the socioeconomic status? So kind of to get at this question, uh, we did this three-way product term. So the methods, uh, we looked at health insurance. So we had health insurance data for each subject. <coughs> we compared those with private insurance versus basically versus all others as a surrogate of lower SES. And then we also came up with an index to synthesize um, census tract um, domains of socioeconomic status. The domains of education, income and occupation, and cost of living. So basically this thing is called a Yoast Index. It was actually developed uh, for California, developed in the context of cancer research, uh, looking at the cancer registry and trying to see um, the relationship between SES and breast cancer risk. So we thought, you know, because I'd worked with people who had been using this for cancer research, this is a great, great way to look at SES rather than 
picking out each individual one and have multiple testing bias. So this is a good synthesis of, of SES. So in this case, we to, to, um, to have an adequate sample size, we basically dichotomize this, this score, which came out of a, a principal component analysis we, did, analysis we did of these SES variables. There were seven of them. How are we doing on time here? A little bit, okay, good. Now for results. Um, so we found that Caline 4 trap levels in both seasons were higher in Hispanic and African American subjects and in subjects without private insurance. Furthermore, we found associations of ambient carbon monoxide and NOx in the cool season were stronger among Hispanics than among non-Hispanic whites. We also found that ambient PM 2.5 in the warm season was stronger in subjects without versus with private insurance. <clears throat> and also, associations of ambient PM 2.5 in both seasons were stronger in subjects living in, in neighborhoods with lower SES as indicated by the lower Yost score. Um, so looking at other demographic factors, uh, we did see that the associations were stronger for the uh, older uh, children, <clears throat> but there, were, uh, there was only one uh, significant product term, however. Uh, we also saw somewhat stronger associations among females, but there was no significant difference uh, in the product term. <clears throat> Three-way interaction models, basically looking across the point estimates, and you can, if you want to look at the details, you can uh, look up the paper that I showed you that was published in Epidemiology where we have all of these results in the online supplement. Um, the three-way interaction models basically showed that the point estimates were not different uh, by these, uh, across these different demographic groups. However, <laughs> as all three-way interaction trends go, uh, you end up with inadequate statistical power. We're basically looking at 240 subgroups. And so needless to say, the 95% confidence intervals were quite wide all the way across there. So in conclusion, uh, we conclude that vulnerability due to higher exposures and demographic susceptibility is supported by our findings showing that Hispanic and African American subjects and subjects without private insurance are more likely to live in residence with higher trap. In association with several of the ambient air pollutions were stronger in Hispanics and subjects living in lower SES neighborhoods as well as subjects without private insurance. Uh, Three-way interaction terms did not give us any evidence that Caline 4 trap was acting as a surrogate for either racial, ethnic, or health insurances, health insurance difference in the studied areas. Um, but because of the small sample size in these various subgroups, we probably lack the statistical power to see any clear difference. So finally, overall conclusions. So the, one of the key findings are that Hospital associations, uh, associations of hospital encounters with ambient air pollution is enhanced in subjects living, with, uh, living near high traffic density areas, particularly in the cold season. And this finding includes subjects with, without private insurance, Hispanic subjects, African American subjects who may be at greater risk. And what this means is that uh, associations that have been published, there are probably, you know, dozens and dozens of time series studies that have shown associations of asthma admissions and ED visits with ambient air pollution may be underestimating the effects in these particularly vulnerable populations that are exposed to high trap. The positive associations that we saw with the uh, model POA were very consistent with the associations we saw with the Caline 4 model trap, as well as the primary ambient gases. Um, so these were, these were very consistent. The, very, the most important sources that uh, we saw were both on-road and off-road sources from diesel and gas sources, as well as other anthropogenic sources and wood smoke. Uh, we believe that the associations with meat cooking are probably due to high correlations uh, with the other anthropogenic sources. Um, we were uh, happy to see that we uh, confirmed the finding that was uh, published uh, from New York that uh, there are independent associations with asthma for PM 2.5, largely independent associations for PM 2.5 and ozone. 
And ozone was not confounded by anything in the warm season, but unfortunately, um, that's probably because there, there were no associations with these other pollutants in the warm season, particularly the primary air pollutants. However, in the cool season, because, because PM2.5 is largely an uncharacterized metric, it's just mass, we did observe that it was confounded in the cool season uh, by various indicators of primary air pollutants. So that a lot of the PM2.5 signal in the cool season is probably coming from primary air pollutants. And from the, uh, from the effect modification analysis that we saw, that's probably an even bigger issue uh, among uh, children who are living near high traffic density areas uh, because of these air stagnation events. Um, unfortunately, SOA, the estimated SOA was not associated with asthma morbidity. And of course, because of that, it didn't confound anything. And um, we believe it's probably because of the imprecision in the SOA estimation. And if you recall in the graph that, uh, that Mike showed comparing um, uh, SOA modeled using actual measurements to, to his, his estimates, uh, his estimates were, were much smaller. So there's a large component in there that we're not, not picking up probably uh, in, in, these, in these modeled estimates. So probably one of the alternate ways is to go and, and as we have done in our cardiovascular study, which is to measure uh, particles, extract the particles, do the chemistry, and then use some tracers for SOA to then go back and look at these hospital admissions. And we do have that data. It's, uh, it's not going to be as, as complete you know, of, a, of a time series as this. It's going to include you know, six months of data rather than uh, nine years. So, um, so that's, that was why we did this, is that we could, we could do this for such a long time period. Limitations, we don't really have any uh, air pollutant constituents. Um, particularly the ones that might be important uh, for these associations with primary pollutants. Uh, there's, of course, exposure air. We only had residential address, and obviously kids are going to go to school and other locations. We don't have any of that information. And uh, when we talked about the Caline 4 modeling, I think you could appreciate that uh, the inputs have you know, low temporal resolution, like annual average density of traffic, for example. Um, there were very high correlations among the various different POA sources, and that's probably because of the inputs in the model being uh, similar meteorologic uh, uh, parameters. Uh, in Anaheim uh, was the only station we had for PM2.5, whereas we had four stations for gases. Um, we did do a sensitivity analysis, though, and we didn't think it was a factor, at least for the gases. Um, and the only individual level socioeconomic variable we had was, was health insurance. The rest were census tract variables. So future needs. Um, I think it's really important to, to nail down uh, these POA exposures and their, and their sources, which ones are important in the different seasons. The wintertime season, particularly wood smoke, for example, we did see associations there uh, as expected. The importance of particle size fraction uh, in asthma that has been under-investigated, I think. And, and this whole issue of, of local versus regional exposures uh, and, and how that, how when we use ambient data, we're, we're mis misclassifying the importance of, of local exposures, particularly to, to traffic and other point sources. Um, and then these multi-pollutant models do suggest that there's, there's an unmeasured part of particle mass that we're not getting at, particularly in the summer. And there's still a huge question mark. Are these secondary organic aerosols or, or what? What are they? So the, the future research is really needed to, to address these uncertainties, um, you know, particularly the fact that we're using a lot of these pollutants as, as surrogates for something, and something that we don't know. And it would be, it'd be really nice to know not only the chemical components, but their sources. And then finally, uh, because we, we found evidence that there are susceptible populations, vulnerable populations, um, based upon race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. I think these are, these are populations that could be targeted uh, for interventions to limit the adverse effects of air pollutants. And these are the co-investigators. You heard from, from Mike, uh, Jun Wu, I told you about, Dan Gillens, our statistician. Uh, Bruce uh, Nickerson was uh, our uh, go-to person, great uh, Pulmonolo pediatric pulmonologist at uh, Chalk in Orange County. 
and then our various uh, staff and two graduate students uh, that have helped us, and we couldn't have done it without them. Thank you. I think we have uh, some time for questions. Questions from the audience. Questions from the audience. It's a lot of stuff. I get dizzy when I have to go, yeah. go through so much. Thank you very much. And uh, is uh, well designed, and the outcome is also helpful for decision making. But uh, from your presentation, I uh, we can see that the model to pollutant model uh, playing very important role in your research. Yes. So do you have some step by step plan to improve the model? Yeah, there uh, a couple of recent pub publications have. Uh, Taken, taken a different different tack. There are, there are different approaches. So the two pollutant model is kind of the go-to method for multi-pollutant modeling. Um, I, I don't think it's the I don't think it's the only approach. There's ways of you know uh, using using different predictors to you know output a, a residual that 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 no longer has the uh, the signal from the other pollutants, things like that. So there there are different ways of looking at multi-pollutant models that that we haven't uh, haven't yet employed. So this is the easiest thing to do, is the two-pollutant model. Yes. Hi, I enjoyed uh, both the talks. It was great. Um, so, so one thing you mentioned was about the results for uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10, the hospitalizations, that, that um, and, and because the two, uh, the results are so similar that you'd expect that the, uh, the PM the, the PM10 is actually coming the the results are actually the uh, c coming from the PM2.5. Yeah, that that question should be for Mike, I think. So, so does that suggest that that PM course is not having any effect? I think what that the implications are that the, for the organics that uh, we were looking at that were the focus of yeah, Ralph's POA. comments that um, uh, PM10 and PM2.5 are equivalent. There are no major sources of coarse particle organics in those calculations uh, that um, somehow give you a different signal in the PM10 size fraction versus the PM2.5 size fraction. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not that's reality. We spend a lot of time getting these models to work for PM2.5 and now for ultrafines. We put a lot less effort into getting these models to work for coarse particles. But we haven't had a project on coarse particles in my group. I'm not sure what's happening in house. I'm not sure who's really pushing that in California. Uh, we certainly haven't been. So it might just be that we haven't spent enough time looking at coarse particles, or that might be reality. And I, I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. Any other questions from the audience? One back there first. Uh, I have a question for, um, this is mostly has to do with ambient pollutant sources, right? And uh, what about uh, indoor, are there, how, are there any attempt, not in this pr project particularly, of course, um, are there any attempt to separate uh, if there are um, in yeah, that's indoor good sources? Because, uh, one of the, uh, um, one of the, um, uh, online uh, questions is very similar to that. It said, did the authors control for other confounding factors like pollen and housing characteristics? Uh, no. <laughs> we, didn't ha we don't have any. So again, the, the, the individual level data that we're limited to is whatever was in the face sheet data of the, of the hospital record, essentially. Um, things like health insurance, type of health insurance, and the residential location, age, sex, race, ethnicity. That's it. We didn't, you know, we didn't go to the subject's house. Um, the, the, the funding level was not that great. So <laughs> uh, for 7,000 subjects, that's, that's a, that's a, that would be a massive undertaking, under, under, undertaking to, 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 to go to that many houses and you know, g give out questionnaires and, and, and all that. We'd love to do that. That would be a great study, but uh, that wasn't what we did. Sure, it's just like, you know, it's just like the time activity, you know, all we have was the residential location and we didn't have any time activity data. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, depends on your conclu conclusion, there was some difference between the warm season and cool season. Yeah. 
So my question is, does there any, uh, does the temperature itself have some impact on the asthma mobility? So how do you identify the impact of temperature? Um, temperature wasn't significant in our analysis. We do, we do adjust for it uh, a priori, same with relative humidity. We just put it in the model. Most of the panel studies I've done also, we just don't see any effect of temperature um, on, on, on asthma. Pers even personal temperature, which was more accurate, you know, where the, we're actually measuring it on the person. In particular, that's not, that's, that's the best way to, to do it. So no, we didn't really see any, any uh, effect there. Um, so, so I think, well, I think what the, the seasonal uh, data is telling us is, is the, the critical importance of these, these air inversions and, and the cold air inversions that, that are occurring in the wintertime where you have this tremendous increase in these, these uh, uh, volatile organic compounds and semi-volatile organic compounds and, and the POA that, that results, uh, results from them. Uh, you know, the, that's, that's not to say that, that these, these pollutants aren't important in, in the warm season. It's just that they're much, they're much, uh, they're in, in much higher concentrations, uh, I should say. The, these are uh, wave questions. One is for Dr. Kleeman. Um, the EC modeling results are in good agreement with ambient monitoring. Could you please discuss the source of the EC inventory used in the model? Is that data available to the public? Uh, yeah, um, so we use the regulatory inventory for all the different sources and then we have the size and composition profiles that we can stamp onto them based on missions inventory testing that we've done. And uh, that data is ARB data as well. ARB has our uh, EC versus OC uh, split for all those major sources. There's, um, we tend to model it um, as the elemental carbon that would be measured with the NIOSH temperature protocol to get into some technical details, which is different than what you would predict as the EC measured using the improved temperature protocol in the instrument.